All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Philemon. Good to see everybody this morning. Good to see some of our visitors from last week here. We've been going through Philemon um, for a number of Sunday nights. And um, so this morning, we're actually going to look at one of the next verses that shows up there, especially, you know, the thought of the new year. You're always thinking of of uh, something to to help you with that in mind. You know, a new year, it, it is a new opportunity. You know, this year, um, maybe, maybe last year wasn't great for you. Uh, but this year could be uh, the best year of your life. Uh, you could be in heaven. We could all be in heaven before the end of this year. Um, so a new year always offers a bunch of opportunities. Um, so let's look at uh, Philemon chapter one. And uh, let's start with verse 17. If thou count me, therefore, a partner... <laughs> Receive him as myself. So for those of you that have not been with us on Wednesday, on Sunday nights and, and maybe you're not familiar with the story of this book, it's very obvious this, this book is very short. It's one chapter. It's a letter that Paul writes to a friend of his, a Christian brother, and um, his name is Philemon. He was appears to be a man of some wealth and ability, but a man that loved the Lord. And Philemon had a servant that had uh, fled from him. You know, back in those days, uh, people had servants, people bought servants, and they were literally your property. And that's just the way it was. And um, Philemon's servant, his name was Onesimus. And Onesimus had one day just decided to take off. And Paul alludes to a couple things here in the letter. It looks like possibly... Uh, Onesimus had stolen some things when he left, um, had just caused some grief in general. And so all this happened more or less unknown to Paul because Paul is in prison at this point in his life. For, for the gospel's sake, he's in prison. And um, through some set of circumstances, um, Onesimus winds up uh, wandering past Paul's prison cell. And Paul was never one to miss an opportunity. You know, a jail cell was not going to stop his Christianity or his witness. And so he starts witnessing to this guy outside of his jail cell, not knowing who he was, not knowing the connection to Philemon. This guy he witnesses to over a period of time becomes a believer and his whole life changes which is what happens when you come to know the Lord. His whole life, his whole attitude changes, and he keeps coming back. He becomes a helper to Paul. He brings Paul food to his prison cell. He, he begins to do all he can to help Paul. And Paul finds out that Onesimus was a runaway slave, and he finds out that his master was Philemon. Well, Paul knew Philemon very well. And so this discussion begins and a decision is made that Onesimus will return to his master, which was unheard of and very risky. Because, you know, you know, today, today is the day, at least in North America, you know, we're so naive. You know, we, 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 you know, everybody, you've got all these activists, you know, and they're trying to make everybody so nice and wonderful and kind and caring. And, and, um, and yet most of the world still does not play by those rules, even remotely, it, you know, human life for most of the world is cheap. And the only reason it's not cheap in some places is because somewhere in their history, Christianity touched their shores and they learned the value of human life. And Onesimus is going to return to his master to make things right or to attempt to. That was unheard of. That's what Christianity does. 
you talk about changing everything. And so Paul says to Onesimus, he said, Onesimus, uh, let me write you a letter. He said, I know Philemon well. He said, Philemon owes his spiritual life to me. What's implied is that Paul had also had a major part in Philemon's salvation. And he said to Onesimus, let me write a letter. He said, when you knock on that door, he's not going to be happy to see you. And he said, but when he looks at you in shock, he said, you hand him this letter. He said, it'll go a long way towards patching things up. And so that's what's going on in this letter. And so let's look at it again. Verse 17, Paul writes to Philemon and he says, if thou, Philemon, count me therefore a partner. He says, if we're on the same page and we're moving the same direction, he said, receive him, Onesimus, receive him as myself. He said, Philemon, he said, just pretend it's me knocking at your door. Verse 18, if he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. He said, let me find out that you handled this well. He said, you'll, you'll put a smile on my face and you'll make the birds sing in my heart, Philemon. Philemon, I'm in prison. It's been sad and dark for me for a long time. He said, why don't you just uh, why don't you just do good to Onesimus? He said, you'll give me some sunshine in my darkness. Verse 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. And really where I want to go this morning is verse 21. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou will also do more than I say. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your precious book and these words, yes. Lord. And God, just reading them, Lord, just it just jumps off the page at us, Lord. Now help us this morning. Lord, there's a lesson here for us this morning. And Lord, help us to receive it, everyone, in Jesus' name. Amen. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee. You know, he says, uh, Philemon, he says, I'm writing you this letter. And he said, uh, he said, really, he says, I'm not worried about how you're going to react. He said, I really think that, he said, I, I am confident that by the time you're done reading this letter, you're, you're not only going to do what I'm asking you, you're going to do more than I've asked you. You know, this was not manipulation. You know, some people try to weave psychology into Christianity, and it's always a bad mix. It doesn't work. God did. God, God is thoroughly acquainted with the psychology of mankind, and God's psychology does not agree with modern psychology on many counts. And he was not trying to be psychological. You know, you got all these books, you know, you know how to win. And, and, I, and there's some good things in some of these books. You know, it would help everybody to be a little more positive. A little more, a whole lot more positive and a whole lot more nice. It was just, it's just common sense. And the Bible talks about that. But, you know, Paul had not just read, you know, Dale Carnegie's book on how to win friends and influence people. And, and you know, you do the sandwich thing. You, you lay on a compliment and then you slip in the negative and then you slap on another compliment, uh, another compliment. They call that the sandwich method, you know, and that way you can sort of, you can sort of hit somebody, but you're, you're buttering them up on both sides and they don't know what's which end is up and, and they, they sort of feel like, oh, okay. You know, they can take it. Well, that's not what Paul was doing here. Paul was not, you know, trying to sneak in the back door while he's blazing through the front door. He's not, you know, it's not the power of suggestion. Well, you know, if you'll sort of hint at it, you know, they'll it'll do something in their subconscious. And they'll... I just want you to understand that is the furthest thing from Christianity. Some of those things may be good and helpful, but they have nothing, nothing to do with Christianity. Nothing. This was not manipulation. He was not saying, Philemon, I mean, I'm confident you'll do this. And, 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 you know, sort of nervous and hoping. It, no, that's not what he's doing. When Paul said this, 
Paul was truly confident that Philemon was going to do what he was asking. And so this really says something about the spiritual character of Philemon. Um, it pointed to the, the, the spiritual compass of Philemon. You know what a compass is for? A compass is, you know, man, when we were little, little guys, you know, a lot of some of you little guys in here, some of you for your birthdays, you know, I'll see you with your little survival gear and you'll have a compass, you know. And, you know, the thought with the compass is that if it's hopefully it always points towards north. You know, you can flip it around, you can spin it. And we used to do that. We take our compass, and we'd spin it around, we hold it upside down, we hold it up and then you'd lay it down. And, and, and the thought is every time that arrow comes back to north. You know, uh, as Christians, we get bumped around and banged around. And, and you know what? That's not just limited to us. That's just the whole world. And uh, but, you know, the things thing about lost people is they have no true compass. They have nothing inside of them that always points back in the right direction. By the way, it's interesting. It says God dwells on the sides of the north. And so that arrow, man, that, that arrow, uh, there's, 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 there's that thing in a Christian's heart that even if you get banged around and you lose your sense of direction, you still know which way is up and you still know which way is the right way. Um, it, it says something about Philemon because Onesimus had been a cause of grief. Onesimus had hurt him and it hurt his family. I, I could ask for a show of hands and I, you know, unless you're under, you know, unless you're under 15 years old, I, I doubt hardly anybody in this room would not raise their hand if I said, has somebody hurt you in, really hurt you in your lifetime? And then I could say, how many of you has a Christian, another believer really hurt you? And you know what? I, I think almost every, almost every hand would go up. But Philemon had not lost his sense of what was right and wrong. You know, just because Onesimus banged his life and banged his world, it didn't, all of a sudden, it didn't throw his compass off. Paul said, Philemon, I am confident <coughs> that you will do what I'm asking you. Paul knew Philemon's track record. You know, when you have a bad compass, you know, some of us, you know, we as kids, we had really cheapos. And uh, I picked up one little kids in here a few months back and, and you know, just bring back memories of playing out in the woods with the compass. And and I didn't tell the poor kid, but I thought, man, this thing is junk. <laughs> you know, I, did, I didn't want to pop his balloon right on his parade. You know, I just hope he doesn't try to, you know, go on a on a journey. <laughs> And, uh, man, I'd flip his compass around, and every time you flipped it and you held it down, it was pointing a different direction. <laughs> you know, there's some Christians like that. They get banged real good, and you just never know which way they're going to go. Their compass is off. Paul knew Philemon, Paul knew Philemon. And you, as you read this letter and you, you read it and you think your way through it and you look at it, you understand that Paul knew Philemon very well. There was some sort of a real connection between these two. And Paul said, uh, Philemon, I am confident. He said, I know I'm asking you to do a hard thing and perhaps, perhaps Philemon, it'll even seem risky to you. You know, I mean, he wasn't the first one that had been robbed. And it probably wasn't. It might not have been the first servant that had robbed him and run off. And he said, Philemon, I know I'm asking you to do something that's out of the ordinary. But he said, but I believe you'll do it because I'm asking you to do it. I'm asking you to do it as a Christian. I'm asking you to do it for the Lord's sake. And, um, and I know your track record. I know that you have always honored the Lord when a hard decision had to be made. Had to be made. He knew his track record. Paul had some knowledge of his private life. Well, that's a, a frightening thing, isn't it? And you know, that's where Christianity is really, that is, that is the test of Christianity, is the private life. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
the Lord told him in Matthew, he said, and when thou prayest, you know, don't, don't sound a trumpet before you and, and, you know, don't pray on the street corner. He said, he said, go into your closet and shut your door and pray to your father, which sin in secret. And he said, the God that's watching you in secret, he'll reward you openly. Paul had some knowledge. You know, you get to know somebody and you get to know somebody well. I realize, you know, hey, um, you know, a lot of us, we just, and, and this this is probably a good thing, but there's a lot of us, we we know we know certain things about each other. We're, so-and-so is friendly, so-and-so is smiley, so-and-so tells corny jokes, so-and-so, you know, so-and-so, you know, likes chocolate, you know, you know, and so-and-so likes to talk about cars and, and you learn certain things about each other. Um, but, but, you know, we, we know very little of each other's private life, but Paul had some knowledge of his private life. How can you have confidence that he's going to obey from a letter? No less. It'd be different if Paul knocked on his door and said, all right, Philemon, now here's Onesimus. I'm going to be watching you. I'll be back tomorrow and I'll be back Tuesday and I'm going to follow up on this. Well, you know, that would give you a little incentive to at least make it look good. There, there's not going to be any of that. Paul says, I'm going to send you a letter. He says, Philemon, I can't be there. I can't follow. I can't check on you. But he said, I believe you're going to take care of this. How, how could he do that? Because he knew something about Philemon's private life. And Paul knew his love for the Lord Jesus. That usually in a little while becomes evident in a person's life. And 1 Corinthians 8, 3, it says, If any man love the Lord, the same is known of him. Man, if you love the Lord, you know, um, you that's, that's something you, it's not that you're trying to keep it secret, but you can't keep it secret. It just becomes evident. Paul knew his love for the Lord. And Paul knew that Philemon was humble enough to hear and receive some very personal instruction. Uh, this is really personal. You know, th this, is, this deal has cost Philemon some money and some damage. And... Um, and Paul is invading in a private affair. You know, I know what some people think, you know, uh, you know, they, they don't think anybody should ever call them on the carpet about anything. Um, and I, I realize, you know, the boy, there's some lines there and there's just some things that have to be. It's not something that's ever done lightly. But Paul is confronting him on a very personal matter. Most people don't do very well when that happens. We work hard at making sure nobody ever gets close enough to have a reason to do that. But boy, sometimes that's where your greatest help comes from. Somebody that knows you well enough to take the risk to say, man, you're making a big mistake here and you're, you're, you're going in a bad direction here. And you know what? You're, you're going to risk. Losing a friendship. And Paul is sticking his nose into a very private affair. Under the leadership of the Holy Ghost. And perhaps that's the key. You know, some people are only too glad to stick their nose in your business. You know, and, you, and, and we, always, we always want to help chop their nose off. You know, but, but it's different when it's under the, the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Paul knew he was humble enough to receive some very personal instruction. And Philemon was not contentious. He wasn't going to argue. Would you keep your place here in Philemon? Because we're going to come back here. But keep your place and go to Romans chapter 1. I want to look at a few verses with you real quick.
You know, some people, they just, they want to debate everything. And some people think that's good. Can I tell you guys something? Um, the, the, it is valuable. Like your kids growing up, they, they used to, uh, they used to teach logic uh, in the universities. And believe it or not, one of the key textbooks for logic for the last 200 years was written by Isaac Watts, which was one of our, hymn, it's one of our hymn writers. And they used his book in secular universities, his book on logic. I've got it at home. It's, 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 a, it's an amazing book. Can you imagine they used it at secular universities? Um, and of course, they, they stopped teaching logic. It's about 50 or 75 years ago. I wonder why. But they stopped teaching logic. And, um, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Some of you remember being in high school and you had, you had debate class, and you had debate teams. And that can be good and that can be valuable. Um, it, it, it can really have a, a good purpose as far as learning to be quick on your feet and, and a quick thinker. And if you can learn to deal with people, especially regarding Christianity versus their skepticism or their agnosticism. But the problem is that, especially more so now than ever before, there's, there's this thing where you've, you've got these Christians. And, uh, you know, really, their Christianity is, is not really hugely about following the Lord and about doing the obvious. In fact, they'll debate with you about the obvious. Philemon was not interested in debating anything. Philemon said, Paul, this is what the Lord told you to tell me? Paul said, yeah. He said, okay, I got no argument. I'm going to do it. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, verse 26, you guys will know, recognize the context. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Nature, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now watch. So these people that he's describing, they get filled with something. The list is interesting. Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate that you know they just uh they just they just want to argue they just want to argue about everything look at romans chapter 2 romans chapter 2 verse 6 the context is you know god's judgment there in romans 2 and in verse 6 it says speaking of god who will render to every man according to his deeds to them so he's going to he's going to name two groups and how god's going to deal with them okay so to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So that's the people that are, that are, they're looking for the right thing. Verse eight, but unto them, the other group that are, and what is their chief quality? They are contentious and do not obey the truth, but, but obey in righteousness, indignation and wrath. And, and you know what it is? They're, they're contentious. They, they just want to argue. They, they want to argue the point. They want to argue about the truth. They, they don't have enough sense just to look at it and say, boy, that's true. And I ought to do that. And I don't even like that. And I don't even want to agree with it. But it's the truth. Boy, it's a wonderful day when someone can look at truth and say, you know, I don't even like this. But I know it's true. You can get somewhere with somebody like that. God can get somewhere with somebody like that. But when they want to argue and disprove, and God says, you know, I got, I, I got something coming for them. 
Look at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. You know what you got nowadays in, in Christianity? You have a spirit, a spirit that has come into um, the churches, and it's it's a real spirit of contention, okay? And uh, I want you to see that. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. Paul writes to the Corinthians who were, you know, notedly very fleshly, very carnal. Saved? Yes. And Paul comments on that, okay? But in verse 11... He says, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Go to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Contention is, it's an argument. First Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verse 14, Paul says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Now, there's a pile of Christians. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in discoursing on this. But just the fact I have to say that tells you something. That there's a bunch of eggheads that don't like the way it's written. And so they're going to argue with me. They're going to argue with God. They can't accept. The, and well, you know, well, you know, uh, you know, other cultures. Oh, so you're going to debate the point. The Holy Ghost, the author of the book, the creator of this world just made a statement. So it's true everywhere at all times in every culture at every age on this planet. This is true forever. And, and you know what? You read that, you start talking about that, and right away somebody wants to argue the point. That's what we're talking about. That's why some Christians, they can't make any headway. That may be the pivotal point for some of you for this year. For this year. This could be the greatest year of your life. This could be the greatest experience of Jesus Christ that you've ever had, ever, if you just won't argue with him. If you'll just say, Lord, I just read this. And Lord, I really have trouble with this. But I know you meant this. God, I'm, Lord, I'm not going to argue. But Lord, would you help me with this? You'll get somewhere. You'll get somewhere. Let's read it. Here we are. Verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. Now watch verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, here's what some people say. They'll read those verses and they'll say, well, see there, Paul just said, if any of you wants to argue about it, just to forget the whole thing. Um, pray tell, that's not what he just said. Why would the Holy Ghost give you two or three verses in this and say, just ignore what I just said? Has God ever done that? You know, some people, they don't think. Paul says this. Paul says, you know, the men ought to have short hair and the women ought to have the longer hair. And he says, and if anybody wants to argue and try to introduce something else, we have no such custom. He said, we're not going to tolerate any deviation from this. We have no such custom that deviates from this. If anybody wants to argue the point, tell them to go somewhere else. Contentious. Contentious. Look at 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. Paul has been addressing in 1 Timothy 6. He comes to the end of that letter. And he addresses this whole thing of servants and masters, which is really what the book of Philemon is about. Okay, It's about a servant 
and his master. And boy, what a what a backdrop. We said it this at the beginning of the book of Philemon. In the book of Philemon, you don't see any doctrine specifically emphasized as doctrine. Paul wrote lots of things that were doctrine. Man, the book of Romans, the book of Ephesians, and, and he says, believe this and don't believe this, and this is how we think about this, and this is how the person of God is, and this is how the church is. He doesn't do that in Philemon. In Philemon, you see Christianity demonstrated. And what a platform. The servant and his master and a bad deal. Oh, my. Now, we have a theater to see Christianity in operation. And that's what you see here. So in 1 Timothy 6, Paul is writing to Timothy, totally unrelated. And he makes some comments about that master-servant relationship. Um, chapter six, verse one, let as many servants as are under the yoke, you know, they're under a contract. They've been purchased, count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of his God and his doctrine be not blasting. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren. Okay. There's, there's Philemon and Onesimus. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. And all of a sudden, Paul drops into verse 3, and he says, if anybody wants to debate this point, verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, and then Paul has all these soft sounding, sweet phrases in verse four. He just comes short of calling him various names. Verse four, Any, the guy that wants to argue, the Holy Ghost says this. He is proud, knowing nothing and doting about questions and strifes of words. Where have cometh envy, strife? Right? He said, he said, the guy that argues is going to be a fountain of trouble. That's what it's going to be. You know, you got this in Christianity, and I'm being facetious. You know, I'm, I'm joking a little bit. But, you know, um, it just recently, again, the flat earth came thing came up. And if you believe in the flat earth, I love you, and we love you, and you're welcome to come. We, we radically, terribly, horribly disagree. And if you'll keep it to yourself, we'll all be fine. This is not a platform for your pet theory. Period. You know, like insurance people come into a church because they can get contacts. I'm um, sorry. The church isn't a fishing hole for financial contacts. It is the church of the living God. That's what it is. You know, and and they come into church, you know, and and, you know, they, they, they count your many blessings. You know, they, they didn't come in to worship and count their blessings unless for them. I think the blessing is why well, I haven't I haven't got too far to the edge of the flat side. You know, you know what they want to do? They they're they're going to get you know we're going to have meal time tonight at the fellowship, and and we're all going to get together and talk and and it won't be fifteen minutes and they'll be sure to bring up the flat Earth and and tell you all those pictures you believe from NASA and all that stuff. You know, and it's all yeah, it's all a bunch of lies, a bunch of craziness. You know, and this guy says this, and this guy says this, and and um. You know what they want to do? If they want you to agree, and if you're not going to agree, wow, the fight is on. Um, just want you to understand. If that's what your Christianity consists of, you have nothing. Whew. A lot of these online dudes, and I'm always shooting at them. Um, there's some great, there's a there's some really good guys on there. But it just seems like people have a way of gravitating towards the worst ones generally. And they're always picking up some dude with some old heresy revived and repackaged. And then that same dude tries to tell you why a church like ours that doesn't agree with them, we're all out to lunch and we're a bunch of ravening wolves and we're sons of Cain, you know, and we're this and we're that. And, Man, you ought to get out of that church and, and all that stuff. You know, one of the things I've noticed about those guys is I, I've, I've, never, I've never noticed any of them that just overflowed with the praises of God. 
It's all about their latest battle lines that they've drawn. I just want you to understand, if you're listening to somebody like that, you need to get off of that. And you need to get, and see, here's where it gets sticky. See, by the time they walk into a church like this, they've already got a bunch of friends on the other side of the fence. And they come into our church and they like it, but now they're torn, especially when somebody holds their feet to the fire on being foolish and contentious about this stuff. And now they've got to choose. And you're right, you got to choose. He said, Philemon, it's such a blessing to have you as my friend. Because Philemon, I know you will not argue with what I'm about to say. He said, I know that if push comes to shove, you are going to choose the right thing. Paul knew, Paul knew this about Philemon, that if Philemon could see something in the word of God, if he could see it clearly, and if he could see it in the Lord Jesus, if he could see, yeah, this is this is of the Lord, this is definitely the Lord's way, this is what he, he knew that if he could show Philemon that, you notice he's not threatening Philemon here. He said, Philemon, one of these online guys, a lynch mob showed up at a friend of mine's house, an evangelist friend. Oh, Christians. Wow. That's why they carry pistols down south, I think. An evangelist. Literally, 10 or 15 guys that follows one of these online goofs showed up at his house, and thank God he wasn't home. I Just something wrong with that. It's just not the sweet spirit of Christ. Philemon, Paul is not threatening Philemon. He's not threatening to excommunicate him. He's not threatening to call down fire from heaven. He's not saying, now, Philemon, if you handle this wrong, you know, I'm going to ask God to kill you. Where do we get off with this stuff? It's not in the book. It's just the fruit of these guys that like battle on their terms. He said, Philemon, he said, I, he says, it's a joy to write this letter. Because he said, I know you. If you can see it in the Bible, clearly. And if you know this is of the Lord, you're going to do it. Did you know that's what our Lord's looking for? You say, what's the Lord look for? He's just looking for some people that just won't argue with him. And they got enough sense that they won't jump on board with all the other arguers. And they'll just look at the book, say, yep, this is what it says, pretty clear. And they'll follow the Lord. That's, that's what our Lord's looking for. That might make all the difference this year for you. Look at verse 21 of Philemon. To me, there's a couple pivotal verses in Philemon. One is because you, you see that picture of, of Paul. You see Paul in this letter is, is it's like he's a picture of Jesus Christ also. Because what is Paul doing? Paul is pleading on behalf of a failure, of a mess, of a sinner. Paul is pleading on his behalf. What does our Lord do? He ever liveth to make intercession for us. He appears in the presence of God for us. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He, ye are dead, and your life is hid in him. Man, if you're a Christian this morning, Jesus Christ, he is pleading on your behalf. You got, you got the best person in the world Amen. pleading for you. And you see Paul, but you see, you see it in another place. Paul says, if he oweth thee aught, put that on my account. He said, uh, Paul says, I'll pay his debt. And you know what the Lord did when he saved you? He paid your debt. It's on his account because you could never pay it and I could never pay it. Praise the Lord. And that's a pivotal verse. 
But I also see verse 21 is one of the most amazing verses in this book. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more, more than I say. Boy, that, that's quite a thing. It's not more than I say. You know, um, one day the Lord came into the disciples and uh, shortly before his crucifixion and the Lord uh, uh, got a, a bowl of water and a, and a towel and he kneels at the disciples' feet. And, and that was not supposed to happen. That was it. Just the whole thing was crazy. And he starts washing their feet and um, he comes to Peter and Peter in classic fashion says, um, oh, Lord. You, you can't wash my feet. You know, Peter, his heart was in the right place, and it really was. And he said, Lord, there's something wrong with this. He said, you're not supposed to be washing my feet. No. you. And the Lord says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then, then we're done. And then Peter goes, oh, well, wash my feet, my hands, and my head, and wash the whole thing. <laughs> That's Peter. You know what Peter said? Oh, Lord, my feet? And then Peter goes over the top. He says, Lord, I'll do, I'll, I'll do, I'll do more. I'll do more. We had two girls that came to help us up north when we lived in northern Ontario. And um, all our kids were just little and um, uh one of, one of our babies had just been born. So we're way up in northern Ontario, way out in the middle of nowhere. And um, so this these two girls from our home church came to help us. And um, they came at separate times. They were both teenagers. They were both about 17, 18 years old. And uh, so one came, and uh, she hung around for a few weeks, and then the other one came. And what a graphic illustration. We, we knew them well. They were friends of our family. We'd watched them grow up. We'd, we all attended the same church together. And uh, so these were close friends of the family. So, um, so the one girl, um, you know, bless her heart, she was there to help. But it really turned into a, a disaster. Um, she would, um, you know, my, my wife was still, even though she was there to help, my wife was doing everything. And, um, and so, so I want you to see the contrast here. That's why I'm doing this. Um, you know, and she she claimed she had this health problem that really robbed her of her energy. And so, you know, every time my wife was white, right in the middle of doing the laundry or doing dishes, she's over on the, the couch, you know, eating a candy bar. And um, and then if, if she found out my wife had a stash of candy bars, she was into the stash. And and um, she just, you know, my wife had to tell her everything, you know, uh, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And and. Um, and really, it was it was like having another child. She was 17. It was like having another child in the house. A big one. Then the other girl came a few weeks later. What a difference. The other girl, she had radar on. She had antennas on. She wasn't trying to impress because this was what she was. This was the way she was raised. And... Um, she uh, she heard my wife put a pot on the stove. She knew it was supper time. She was, without a word being said, she was up. Man, she was setting the table. She was doing this. She was doing that. Uh, she'd walk in, see, oh, there's some laundry there. You know, uh, she didn't say, what would you like for me to do now? You know, she, she didn't do that. She, she, I know there's a place for that. But, but she came in and she, she grabbed the laundry. She looked for things that needed done. I mean, she was on it, on it, on it, on it. You know, Paul said, Philemon, he said, one of the things I appreciate about you, he says, you won't just do the bare minimum that I'm spelling out. He said, I know that you are going to do more than I say. He says, you know, Philemon, if I've forgotten to write something in, you're going to fill in the blank. You're going to do it. Thou wilt do more than I say. You know, there's a difference in the way Christians view the Christian life. And 
And some people, they are, you know, pretty mediocre. And I think that's the spirit of our age. It's just really easy to do that. Um, you know, our, our world, we got, we got so much going on. We're going so many different directions. It's just easy to, um, and then some people, their attitude is, is, um, well, you know, what, what's everybody else doing? You know, um, Philemon wasn't going to do that. Uh, some people's thought is, you know, I'll, I'll do, I'll do what I need to, to get by. You know, I've got an awful lot to do. I can't be bothered with too much. For the Lord, oh, I can't be bothered with too much. Paul talked about the letter and the spirit, and he said, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. If a man compel thee, our Lord said to those Jews who were oppressed by the Romans, he said, if a man compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. And the reference to that, the, the, the Roman soldiers, by law, could walk up to a random stranger on the street, and he could take all his gear off and it could be a 75 year old man sitting there and he'd say, grab my gear. You carry it the next mile. And by law, by law, there was no recourse. You know, uh, they had to grab that. They had to grab that load and carry it a mile. And Jesus looks and this is why the Pharisees hated Jesus. Jesus said, if that happens to you and he says, carry it a mile, he says, you carry it, too. You know, the Lord said, except your righteousness exceed the right, exceed, exceed. I know that you'll do more than I say. He said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You saw no eyes into the kingdom of heaven. Um, what was the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Um, you know, we know what, what rascals they were and what hypocrites they were. And yet outwardly, they did many of the right things. Look real quickly at Luke 18. We're about done. Luke 18. Luke 18. Verse 9. Luke 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other pair a publican. The Pharisee, you know, really religious dude. Publican, a notorious crook, okay? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Do you realize who these guys were? He said, I fast twice in the week. That, that was an every week deal. I, I Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there's anybody in this room. And we would pride ourselves on being miles ahead of the Pharisees because we're not pretenders, and, and rightfully so. But we would pride ourselves on being miles ahead of the Pharisees. But they fasted twice a week. This guy did every week of his life. We don't do that. He gave tithes of all that he possessed. You know, we give tithes of our cash. OK, um, but, you know, they didn't just tithe on their cash. They tithed on their animals and they tithed on their mint and their roux and their spices. And they tithed on everything you could imagine. We don't do that. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Look at Luke 11, Luke 11. More than I say, more than I say. Luke 11, verse 42. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye pay tithe, excuse me, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. You know, they were doing some right things and they were rigid and exacting on some of those things. But but they passed over some of the most basic things. Paul writes to Philemon and he says, he says, I, I'm, it really blesses my heart to write this letter to you, Philemon, because he says, I am confident 
that you're going to do what I'm asking. And he says, I believe you're going to do more than I say. You know what might make the difference for you this coming year is doing, doing, and I'm going to clarify this second, doing just enough versus more. Now, when I say that, I don't mean, I don't mean um, getting busier and, you know, and uh, tying up every night of the week. Man, I know churches that are like that, where they literally, they got a program going every night of the week and they want total involvement. And, uh, you know, they, they would have you doing 35 things and, and, uh, you know, there's a need for doing things. I'm not, I'm not neglect. I'm not minimizing that, but, but that's really not what our Lord's interested in. See, the Pharisees did all the outward things. The Pharisees made all the public appearances. The, the Pharisees made it look good, but what was missing was what was in the inside. Their compass was all messed up and, and what was missing was there. You know, there's three words that Paul is famous for. You read and over and over and over again, Paul will say, you know, I, I want you to do this. You're doing great here. You're doing great here. But he said, but I want you to do this. And he said, I want you to do it more and more. Those three words. You ought to look up those three words and see how often they appear. He says, as you have learned how to walk and to please God, he said, so you ought to abound. Now, the word abound is a pretty big word all in itself. Abound means abundance. That's a lot. But, but Paul could never leave it there. He didn't say just abound. That would have been enough, but he said more and more. And what was he talking about? Was he talking about, you know, getting tied up with more, more running and more? No, how you ought to walk and to please God. See, some people, they, 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 it's, it's, their Christianity is just enough. But what would make all the difference is if it was more. You know, some people, they, they have enough to pacify their conscience but not enough to make them glad. Some people make it look good, but some people make it actually good. Paul said, he said, Philemon, I know you'll do more than, more than I say. He wasn't talking about bustling activity. He was talking about a perspective, a perspective. You know, this thing where, you know, you want to, hey, listen, this could be the greatest year of your life. Um, could you, uh, is there anybody in this room, please don't raise your hand. Is there anybody in this room that could say, bless God, I got it down. You know, I, I read the Bible enough. You know, and I, I think about the Bible enough. That sounds a little criminal to just even say that. I, I think about the Bible enough. And I praise the Lord enough. Are, are any of us there? You know what make this the better year than last year? We, we know what he said. You know, most of us have been at this a little while and, and it's not complicated and, and we know it. And you know, we, you know what? There's different levels here and everybody's growing and, we, you know, you understand all that. Well, what's our goal for this year? Could you do more than he said? You know, he, 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 you know what the Lord did? We got that, this, this chart here, you know. Praise the Lord. You know, we always have a dinner every every year uh, for the people, you know, that, that make an attempt at this. And, and what a blessing. 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day. You, have you Has your phone reminded you of your screen time this week? How many of you have a little notification that pops up about how much screen time you're on the screen, the screen this week? Oh, I got a few of you. Um, do you think you think it it it? It might help if you just gave the Lord a little more, a little more of your tongue, a little more of your praise, a little more of your will. You know, uh, the children of Israel came into the promised land and the Lord says, I want you to take it over. He says, that land is yours. I'm giving it to you forever. And he says, I want you to go in. I want you to get those giants out, those people that have committed abominations after abominations for hundreds of years now. The Lord said, I want that place purged and I'm giving it to you. So you know what? They, they make it across, and there's five years of battle. The Bible tells us that, five years. And then they've they finally taken the land at large. And one day the Lord looks at Joshua and says, Okay, Joshua, he says, you're getting old now. And he says, you've done a great job. But he said, now you need to turn it over to the tribes, and they need to take their own inheritance. So you've got these people that the nation as a whole had taken the big ground. You know what you and I have done as believers? We've taken the big ground. Many of those of you that are saved in this room, there was a day when you bowed your knee to the Lord Jesus and you put your trust in him. And the biggest problem in your world that was killing you, was going to take you to hell, was your load and your past and your sin. 
You know what the Lord did? He blotted it out. He gave you a new start. And man, you took the land. You crossed the Jordan. You, things start happening. And Lord looks at Joshua and says, okay, Joshua. He says, you guys have taken the land. But he said, uh, he said, now, he said, I want you, all the tribes, he said, they're all going to take their own part now. And he says, this is where they're going to live. In other words, he said, now they need to tackle what's close to home. And what was close to home? There were still pockets of resistance. They hadn't gotten all of them. There were still a remnant of giants here and a remnant of these people here and a remnant of these people hiding here. And he said, uh, Lord, Lord said, Joshua, he says, you guys have done well. But he said, but there remaineth yet much land to be possessed. He said, tell them now to take what's close to home. Christianity is a joy. You get saved and the birds start singing and the burden of sin rolls off your back and you know you're going to heaven and nothing will ever change that. But you know what the Lord wants you to do now? You know what the Lord wants me to do now? He wants me to zero in on the things that are close to home. There are the pockets of those little things, maybe still pockets of things from the past or maybe pockets of things that are still trying to get in Pockets of things that are hindering me or you somewhere. And the Lord said, you've done well, but there's more. Would you do more? And Paul prays. And he said, Philemon, I write this joyfully. He said, I am confident in you. Because I know you're not just going to do the bare minimum to make it look good and to keep your wife off your back. He said, you're going to do everything I say and more. Is there something more for you this year? There probably is. If you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, what, what do I do next, Lord? You know what he'll tell you? He'll tell you what it is. Let's pray. Lord, the only thing that waits for us, Lord, in doing this is more of your favor and more answers to prayer and more blessing. Lord, help us. You have not been a hard taskmaster and you still are not. Lord, you're so gracious. And Lord, if we never do another thing, you're still going to love us. You're still going to take care of us. You're still going to take us to heaven. But, Lord, this could be the best year of our life. If we just wouldn't be satisfied with what we've done in the past. Lord, would you help us that with gladness. We would say to you, Lord. I want to do what you say. And Lord, I want to do more than you say. But would you help us? In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, the piano's going to play. If God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him?
Peter said, Lord, don't just wash my feet. Wash my head and my hands and everything, Lord. Lord, I, we'll just take this right over the top, Lord. You know, the Lord, Lord's always blessed by a spirit like that. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us, bringing us through another year. And um, Lord, we just, when we count our blessings, Lord, truly, we have a mountain of them to count. And Lord, we've gotten so used to some of them. Lord, we don't even see them. Thank you, Lord, for how good you've been. And thank you, Lord, for how good you will be. Lord, we look forward to this year. And um, Lord, may we go forward for thee. Lord, may we not stagnate. May we not get stuck in one spot, Lord. Lord, you want to hold us by the hand. You want us to walk with you. Lord, help us to go to all the places holding your hand that you want us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.